We're going to talk today about a study that we've been conducting uh, in the Juvenile Justice Centre in Woodlands uh, for the past two years, looking at young people's transitions from custody. Uh, so I'll provide a bit of background context in relation to um, the evolution of youth justice, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, to then provide some context in relation to our specific study and uh, what we were engaged in there, and then Siobhan will be talking through some of the findings and hopefully some of the implications uh, for policy and practice from that. And obviously we will welcome questions at the end in relation to um, anything that you may want to discuss. Firstly, just to say that our study was funded uh, by the Youth Justice Agency and we thank them for the support to do that. Um, and many of you will be aware about the context in which youth justice has evolved in Northern Ireland. Obviously, from the uh, Good Friday Belfast Agreement, the Criminal Justice Review, and the outworkings of that in terms of the Justice Act. A key focus in relation to youth justice in particular was this question of legitimacy about making the justice system meaningful for young people and bringing communities on board in the administration of justice. And critically in relation to the Good Friday Agreement, in relation to the criminal justice system, particularly for young people, the issue of human rights, accountability, transparency and due process have been at the heart of um, developments in that respect. So uh, restorative justice, as you will all know, is at the principle of, of the youth justice system at the heart of that, and youth conferencing is an aim to bring legitimacy to processes. Um, the Youth Justice Review, which was instituted following the devolution of policing and justice powers back to the Assembly, um, looked at aspects of the youth justice system and how it had been playing out uh, following the um, establishment of the Youth Justice Agency over the number of years. And the Youth Justice Review acknowledged the steps that had been made in relation to the youth justice system, particularly complementary about restorative justice approaches, but highlighted a number of areas in the system that needed to be addressed and made a series of recommendations in that respect. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the recommendations, there were 31 in all, uh, focusing, for example, on raising the age of criminal responsibility, on the issue of criminal records, on the issue of diversionary practices, and whether we can call diversion youth conferences truly diversionary, given the fact that it does bring young people into the system. Looking at the overrepresentation of looked after young people within the system and making uh, policy recommendations to that effect. And obviously there's been an implementation programme in relation to the Youth Justice Review that has been ongoing, and the Justice Bill uh, that Alistair Ross mentioned at the start addresses some of those issues, particularly the area of the paramountcy principle placing the best interests at the heart of the youth justice system. Also within the Youth Justice Review, the question of the detention of young people in custody was an area that was highlighted, and in particular the issue around the remand, the high use of remands within the youth justice system, within the Juvenile Justice Centre. Um, you'll see in your slides that uh, the average daily population of the, youth just, or the Juvenile Justice Centre has declined uh, over the last number of years. Uh, the latest statistics published by the Youth Justice Agency in 2014 reported an average daily population of 27 young people as compared to 32 in 2008 and 2009. But what we see further from the Youth uh, Justice Agency own workload statistics is that there's a high deal of churn within that system. So you have young people coming in, in and out of the system at frequent rates. Um, and just to report on some of the statistics that are reported by the Youth Justice Agency themselves, 741 transactions, as they're called, young people coming in and out uh, into the system in 2013 and 2014, but pertaining to 196 young people. So Although the Juvenile Justice Centre is dealing with a relatively small number of young people, there are young people with a high degree of need who are entering in and out of the system at frequent rates. So just to look specifically at our own study, um, myself and Siobhan have been involved in this study for two years, as I've said, and what we were doing is looking at the experiences of young people within the juvenile justice system. Their entry into the juvenile justice centre, their experiences within the Juvenile Justice Centre and their process of transition as they exited from it. So the research involves conducting a life history interview with the young person when they were in custody and arranging follow-up interviews at periodic intervals after they've left custody. For the life history interview, we simply begin by asking young people to tell the story of their life. And this method is premised on the fact that each individual has a unique story to tell and a unique understanding of that experience. 
But although each biography is unique, the stories that they tell are also embedded in particular social and cultural contexts. As a personal narrative, life histories reveal young people's interpretations of events and enables us as researchers to make sense of how they make sense of their social world, their situations past and present. Asking the young person to tell the story of his life provides the opening into this account, and importantly, it's the young person's story to tell. And as we proceed in further stages of the research, when the young person leaves custody, we can use the life story as a reference point to pick up on themes that, that were raised. We conclude the first interview by asking young people about their plans for when they leave custody and what supports are in place and then pick up on these themes in subsequent interviews. So we've interviewed, uh, we've conducted 21 life history interviews with young people and followed them into the community. Some of the young people we've now interviewed on up to four occasions and we've explored their transitions from custody and sometimes their subsequent re-entry into custody. Reflective of the population, following young people at times has been an issue. Uh, most of the time this has been, be been because it's been difficult to locate the young person in the community, changing mobile phone numbers, missed meetings, etc. Um, all of the things that you will probably be familiar with and indeed you know, are reflective of practitioners' experiences also. But we try and persist uh, to follow the young person and to explore you know, how they're getting on within the community. Given the dynamic nature of the population and the length of the process, we have young people who we initially recruited in 2013 with whom we've stayed in contact, so they've been uh, involved with us over that period of time. Looking at the structural circumstances of their lives, in many respects the life accounts of the young people in our sample are not wholly different to youth custodial populations elsewhere. As Barry Goldson consistently notes, wherever we may look, youth justice systems around the world characteristically process the children of the poor. The corollaries between child poverty, social and economic inequality, youth crime, and the process of criminalization are undeniable. And this was very much reflected in the family and community lives of the young people in this research. Most lived in areas ranking high in deprivation indicators, and the level of poverty and depth of poverty experienced by the young people was evident in our visits to some of their homes for follow-up interviews. The family lives of a significant number of the young people could be described as chaotic, with some young people living between family homes, extended families, and or having periods in care or being homeless, living with friends or sofa surfing. Others had moved from the family home or from the area with their family due to threats issued by paramilitaries. Reference to domestic violence, difficult relationships with parents or step-parents, alongside traumatic life experiences <coughs> such as the incarceration of a parent, the paramilitary punishment, shooting or physical attack, or death of a parent, also featured in the young people's accounts. And the punitive or harsh nature of unstable family life and housing experiences for some could be seen to impact on their offending careers. Ronan, who's uh, quoted in one of the slides, for example, was 17 when we interviewed him and had lived between the family home with his mother and siblings and his grandparents' home while growing up. He was in and out of foster care from the age of 14, had been in homeless accommodation with his mother, had a short stay with his father and lived with his girlfriend prior to being remanded in custody. He had also experienced multiple uh, custody on multiple occasions. Ronan's mother had a serious alcohol problem, and Ronan was so concerned for the welfare of his younger sister that he phoned social services, and this led to his sister being taken into care, which obviously impacted on his relationship then with his mother. He said that he started stealing from the age of 13 or 14 to buy food or clothes, and when he was 16, his, mother's di his mother died. <coughs> While for others, the potential, the impact of chaotic family life on process of criminalization was more implicit, Ronan himself drew the link. So within this population, some of the common characteristics of the young people that we interviewed, which were reflective of the population that come into the Juvenile Justice Centre, include inevitably a wide range of offending. Many of the young people had multiple previous system contact with a notable exception of uh, one young person who had been uh, incarcerated uh, for involvement in riotous behaviour during the flag protest that took place in that period. For many of the young people, there were complex issues, including polydrug use and alcohol, which were features of their offending, and other difficulties within their lives. And in many instances, these intersected with mental health issues, including suicidality and self-harm. 
Experiences of justice and sense of legitimacy are mediated by wider experiences within the community and contact with the system. And Siobhan is now going to discuss some of these specific findings in relation to young people's experience of custody specifically and punishment within their communities before concluding with the implications for the youth justice system and the wider system. So Nicola gave a bit of background to the context of the young people's lives situations and for us what we found was that the context of young people's lives revealed much about the impact, um, revealed much about their experiences of custody um, including their experiences of remand. Um, two key issues emerged consistently. Firstly the impact of the lack of wider supports on the nature of remand experiences and also the impact of the multiple complexities of young people's lives on their ability to, to adhere to bail conditions. A lack of wider support, uh, including family support, meant that some young people have been waiting for a number of weeks for su suitable bail addresses. This was also as a result of limited appropriate accommodation within some areas, which impacted on this delay. Added to this, the conditions placed on some young people when they did receive bail, especially given their problematic drug and alcohol use, meant that bail conditions were inevitably breached and that young people were returned to custody. And this churn that Nicola talked about around remand and bail was evident in the counts of a number of the young people, with one young person in particular noting that he actually preferred to be on remand rather than on bail because some of the onerous conditions um, attached to his bail. And we know that this issue has been raised a number of times in the Youth Justice Review and in the Law Commission's consultation on bail law and practice. The Youth Justice Review in particular noted that some young people were at risk of being set up to fail due to the nature of the conditions placed on those who already have chaotic and unsettled lives. And we use the case example of Hugh um, within the slides, which you can't see, so within your handouts to, to demonstrate this. Hugh's um, life situation demonstrates the dual impacts of a lack of family support and his personal struggles with drugs and alcohol on his experiences of remand and on his transition from custody. Hugh explained that he was in and out of the juvenile justice centre. He said, I didn't have a bail address to go to. I went on the run because I was in a B&B outside the town in which he lived and I just thought nothing's going to work for me. Like I've been in and out of B&Bs like nothing normal. Like social services have just been swinging me from one place to another. The lack of a bail address and being placed in temporary accommodation, often with few support networks, could then inevitably lead to conditions being breached and young people being rearrested. In the case of Hugh, the situation led to him entering into further difficulties with drugs and alcohol and actually leading him into further offending. So the circumstances of Hugh's release from custody could be seen to impact on subsequent behaviour and contact with the criminal justice system. Also in relation to experiences of custody, Nicola talked about this notion of, um, Victor Rios uses this notion of punitive environments, and he talks about the various aspects of marginalised young people's lives that are, are harsh and damaging towards them. He talks about this in terms of families, schools, communities and the neighbourhood. And this notion of punitive environments had real resonance in the life histories of the young people with which we spoke. The nature of their personal, family and community lives of some actually meant that detention in the juvenile justice centre was described as a period of respite. Some young people described the JJC as a place to detox, to come off things and to recuperate. In the words of Anthony, he said, it's like a detox centre, you just come in and get off all the drugs and get fit again. The rewards of detox obviously also had pains with many young people talking about the difficulties of coming off various drugs while incarcerated and the impact of this on their sense of well-being. The experience of many young people though was that the juvenile justice centre met their welfare needs, which very much underlined the fact that these were not being met elsewhere. Reference was made to the range of activities available within the centre and the fact that there was a structure and routine to everyday life. And in a number of interviews, young people also noted the materiality of their surroundings. They had their own rooms, they had access to resources that were not necessarily available outside. 
And Robbie's um, experience was a stark illustration of how his welfare and his safety needs were not being met in the community when he said of the Juvenile Justice Centre that you have no worries about people looking for you, you have no worries about nothing, you have no worries about going and getting food. This, of course, is not to suggest that young people did not want their freedom and that there were not pains associated with confinement. But in many of the accounts, young people noted the positive welfareist aspects of having their basic needs met, while at the same time desiring to be outside and actually free of all system contact. For some, however, like you, the desire to be free in the literal sense, as well as also free from drugs, was double-edged because he wasn't sure if he had anywhere to go upon release, and he was also unsure if he could abstain from drug and alcohol use when on the outside. The anticipation for you of rejection by his family um, permeated his accounts, and we interviewed Hugh four times. Um, and while he desired to be free, the thought of what would happen to him on release when he had re-entered because he had breached bail um, was a constant source of anxiety. Hugh said, I have no problem with being in here because, I don't know, I guess you get used to it after a few times. But then it's just the fact that when you have bail, you just have nowhere to live. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. In highlighting these welfare benefits of the, ju of the Juvenile Justice Centre, therefore, we're also highlighting the welfare deficits and poverty in young people's lives more generally, which in many cases in their accounts could be seen to account for involvement in crime and for their multiple remands to the Juvenile Justice Centre. I want to now say a little about experiences of community um, justice, because while the young people with which we spoke would often be defined primarily as offenders and sometimes prolific offenders, many we know are also victims um, in many ways. In particular, within our research, over half of the young people with whom we spoke had been direct victims of paramilitaries in the form of either verbal threats, physical intimidation and assault, and exiling or exclusion from their communities. A number of young people explained their contact with paramilitaries as a result of being viewed as antisocial, or in their words, as hoods within their local communities. And while their experiences were varied, a number of the young people had multiple experiences and contacts with paramilitaries. Anthony, for example, reported that he had been beat black and blue loads of times. Patrick, at the age of 14, reported that paramilitaries had broken his jaw. Cahill said he'd been shot at. Uh, Sean reported the paramilitaries had put the gun to my face and said, if you don't stop, you're getting shot in the knees. Two young people, along with their families, had, reloco had relocated following death threats or exclusion orders. And while in some cases the police conveyed messages to young people's families that they were under threat, this was actually um, in relatively few instances. And no matter how serious young people's contacts with paramilitaries were, they were unequivocal in the response that they had not and would not report these to the police. This in itself demonstrates the continued impact of the historically poor relationship between communities and police and the continued fear of identification and, and retaliation by paramilitaries. The continued legitimacy deficit in policing, where there's a lack of trust and suspicion of the police among some, it has been suggested, may in fact enable these alternative forms of justice to remain. Other research that um, myself, Nicola, and our colleague Claire Dwyer are currently involved in um, has found that alleged increases in crime and antisocial behaviour in communities, alongside perceived inequalities in the formal system of justice, remains a pull in communities towards these fifth swift forms of justice. Ultimately, however, the legitimacy deficit may actually facilitate this behaviour because the lack of reporting of it actually makes it easier for paramilitaries to continue to exert fear and control. So then, while some of the young people are victims of serious intimidation and violence within their communities, often on multiple occasions, their victimisation regularly remains invisible. Yet the informal punishment, regulation and control experienced by young people in our research, when added to their experiences with the formal criminal justice system, amounted to multiple forms of punishment. Punishment outside the formal justice system, layered over judicial punishment, meant that actually young people's access to justice was not always perceived as possible by them. 
I just want to end by making a few comments in terms of what some of this might mean um, for uh, policy and practice. Um, we're in the early stages of uh, anal analysing some of our research. Clearly what has come out um, wasn't necessarily what we um, initially spoke to the young people about. The issue of violence in within their communities is very real. And the impact of um, community violence on young people appears in many respects to have dropped off the political agenda. Linked to this, greater, there needs to be greater emphasis on the rights of young people to be protected from harm within their communities. And while, of course, it's encouraging that the Justice Bill incorporates the best interests of the child into the aims of the juvenile justice system, um, this rights and welfare ethos also needs to be reflected in the wider context of these young people's lives. As Nicola said, within the young people's accounts, there was many, uh, much discussion of the relationship between drugs, al alcohol, uh, mental health, and involvement in crime. And there's a need for drug, and alcohol, and mental health interventions that are tailored towards young people's needs. There's a need also for young people to have trusted and consistent supports, particularly in the context of bail. And we're aware that this has been raised on a number of occasions, again, by the Law Commission's consultation on bail, um, but came out very, very clearly within these young people's um, accounts also.